So I will start off with what I do, right? Um, so those of you who know me know that the last time you saw me, I was like an avid Go programmer. I did Go on everything. Uh, since then, I sort of like fell down a rabbit hole. I've been programming blockchain um, about 27 hours a day. <coughs> okay, I work for a company called Hello Gold, a Malaysian, a Malaysian startup. We allow people, to, like ordinary people, to buy a fractional investment in gold bars which are vaulted in a vault in Singapore. Right? The reason we do this is because uh, a number of us were around during the Asian financial crisis in '97. Right? Our, our CEO remember, was working for the Securities Commission in Malaysia, and he remembers how a whole load of his friends just had savings accounts. And in the course of a few weeks, their savings got cut in half. Okay. Uh, I remember being in Singapore. I started my company. I started my own company about two weeks before the Asian financial crisis because I had got a fantastic sense of timing. Um, and I noticed that a few weeks into it, you could walk across Orchard Road practically without looking. People weren't going out, right? It was quiet, and it wasn't as bad there as it is here. But if you look, so like the ring get roughly half in value in a matter of weeks. The Thai bar, the Indonesian rupiah, did a lot worse. Now, our CEO went on to be, being the CFO of the World Gold Council in London. He was in charge of Spider Gold, which is which was one of the world's largest ETFs, and this was. And he's a, a gold-backed ETF, right? Exchange traded fund. It's, it was traded on the New York Stock Exchange. At one point, they had some disgusting number of tons of gold. Anyway, so he was running that, and he and he started thinking about what and you know could we bring like shrink that product down to something for ordinary Malaysians and later like people in the region. Because ordinary guys do not have decent saving and investment options in Malaysia. Right? Um, and the same applies to the other countries. But, you know, Singapore, people get all kinds of options, but here, no. So he wanted to bring something in like that. So that's so he set up Hello Go to fulfill that need. Right? About a year ago, we had developed a product which you know, mobile app, back-end, which is database, uh, the central system built in Ruby, the microservices written in Go, that I did the microservices. Um, you know, the, the, the handled that, but we wanted to take the whole thing on the blockchain, uh, on a number of private blockchains which communicate across public blockchains to between countries. Because we want, um, obviously, the moment you mention gold in Malaysia, the first word that comes to mind is scam. Actually, that's the second word. The first word is usually bloody, then scam, right? Um, and so, firstly, he wanted everything to be auditable, transparent. And the second thing that he did was he, he made sure that we worked with credible partners who were auditors. So we work with Aon Credit, we're now working with Cellcom, we work with their boot wallet, right? So that people can trust us. So, we have moved now to developing a product on the blockchain. We ran a token sale last year. We raised funds to boost our expansion. Um, okay, that's where we got to. So, in the last yeah, I have been doing probably more blockchain work than I have Go work. And as I said, it was only four o'clock today that I said, yeah, I could do something. <laughs> so this is probably going to be highly interactive. Okay? Hi, camera. <laughs> Not prepared, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so firstly, who knows what blockchain is? Let's start at the very beginning. Okay, so we're going back to this again. 
Fair enough. Let's find my notes from JSConf in that case. They should be here somewhere. I probably closed them. <coughs> Let me see. Have I got any notes here that say anything to do with JSConf? No, bugger it. Don't worry about it. Hey, is that it? Hey, smart contracts, Google Slides. That might just about be it. Um, let's see. We'll, we'll start at the beginning of this. It was written for the, for the JSConf in Singapore, but never mind. Um, so we will scoot down to my blockchain in five minutes. Is it there? It's there. I, there's a way to do this, isn't there? Anybody know how to use this damn thing? Somebody did it for me like, ah, yeah, there's a thing here that says present. I put my glasses on. I'll see where it is. Then, anybody see where the button is that, that allows you to present? Up there. up there, yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Blockchain in five <coughs> minutes. Nothing to do with Go, nothing to do with anything in particular. What? But this is what a blockchain is all about. Um, so, a blockchain is a load of signed transactions collated into signed blocks, each of which is linked to a previous Each of which is linked to the previous block in such a manner that everybody agrees that their copy of the blockchain or the ledger or whatever you want to call it matches everybody else's copy of the ledger. And that didn't take five minutes, did it? Oh, that was cool. Uh, <coughs> so what's a transaction? Right, so here we go. It basically says something goes from me to you. Uh, what it is that goes. So from Dave to somebody. This is the value of the transaction. And maybe we've got a little bit of data describing why we're doing the transaction or something like that. Right? This is a typical ledger entry, right? Um, now, assuming that we just have an ordinary ledger, then if we start with nothing or with one person having all the dosh or something, at the end of it, you can calculate each person's balance by the sum of all the items, by the sum of all the transactions, right? You know, match the ins and the outs and so on. So, there we go. It was easy, wasn't it? Um, but what do I mean? It's signed. Who knows about, about digital signing? Not enough hands. Not enough hands. Yeah, but what does it mean? Okay, so, you know what a hash function is? Please tell me you know what a hash function is. Yes? Yes. Hash functions? Yes. yes. Good. You know, where basically you change one little bit in the data and the hash changes dramatically. So you cannot fiddle. So if I've got, if I've got, if I publish a hash value, no one can change the data, right? Okay. So, and you must have come across public key infrastructure, public private key stuff, right? So if I encrypt something with my public, with my private key, anybody with my public key can read it, yeah, or vice versa. Yeah. Okay, so if I take the hash and I encrypt it with my private key, then anybody can decrypt that private key to get the hash back. And once they've got the hash back, they can calculate the hash of the data and make sure it matches. But they can't fake the hash because they don't have my private key. Yes? No? Maybe? <laughs> Come on, give me a smile. Yes? Cool. Right, okay. So, by encrypting my, the hash you, of the data, you can, you can basically make that data immutable. Right? Nobody can change it without it being recognized. Um, we use something called Ketchup 256, but that's, merely, that's quite academic until I talk about it later. Right, so we stick, these, we stick each of these transactions in blocks. Right, we start off with what we call the Genesis block, which I assume was a musical joke. Um, and we, from that, the next block has to point to the Genesis block, and the one after that points to that, and so on. So that if you've got the last block, you can find all the other blocks. Because the block is also signed. 
including the links to this block. Right? And everybody agrees on it. How does everyone agree on it? Well, I'm, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say magic, all right? I'm not going to bother going into consensus mechanisms because they're really not that important for this discussion. In other words, if you're really interested, don't bloody look at it yourselves. It's, it's great fun. Uh, oh, God. Sorry, can you give me one second? I have not. Is this live streaming? No. It's a yes, private it number, they can go away then. Fine. <laughs> Whoever was calling, call me back, okay? Right, so that's five minutes. Um, so now, the thing is, where the smart contracts come in, um, I had that little field that said the reason I'm giving you the money, right? Which is basically just a data field. Um, and... If we, if we try really clever, we can actually put in data that I could associate with a series of instructions. And after all, in, in data fields, you quite often put instructions like, you know, please catch this check immediately or something like that. Right? But we could put a series of bytes and interpret it using byte code instead. Now that would be something, wouldn't it? Because up until Ethereum, all blockchains were, were means of trading settlement systems or whatever. The smart thing about Ethereum was saying, well, we've got this thing, why don't we start doing something with the data as well? Right. So, what then happened is that if you send a transaction to nobody and you format the data field just right, that data gets made persistent in a way that it will be treated as a contract. A contract. A contract's like a class. Right? So it's something, it's got methods, it's got persistent data, stuff like that, right? And when it gets stored in such a way, people can interact with it by sending transactions to it. Right? So it says now, I mean, I send, I send one transaction to nobody, so it ends up sitting up there. The next transaction I can have, instead of going to you, I can send transactions to it to interact with it. So I, I can now make it start um, creating its own sequence of events that lead to change state and so on. Right? Does that make any kind of sense at all to anybody? Come on, come on. We're not in school now. We can be interactive. Come on. Yeah, but, um, Are you what, what is the uh, Ethereum virtual machine implemented? How, how is it implemented? Uh, ah, well, there's an implementation in Java. There's an implementation in Go. There's an implementation in C++. There are JavaScript implementations. Which one do you want? I'm uh, just more curious about the in terms of... Uh, it's a, it's ba basically, it's a stack machine. Okay. <laughs> it's a stack machine with a really horrible assembly language, which means that they then build front-end languages to talk to it. Um, what have we got? So there you go, there's code on the blockchain. Okay. Impressive, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> right? Um, but of course, when you put it on the blockchain, you can also verify the source code, because if you've got the source code and the right version of the compiler, you can then push that up to Etherscan, and Etherscan will say, okay, using the same compiler that you used, and this source code, yes, it matches, and then they will publish your source code. The dodgy thing is they're the only people doing it. Um, okay, so we'll, we will come to Etherscan and things in a while. Um, right, so anyone can verify the source code. If you, I, but you could literally tell anybody, I'm using this version of the compiler with or without optimization. Here's my source code, and they can verify it themselves because anybody can browse the entire um, blockchain. Right? <coughs> right. Anyone can see the transactions in here. There are transactions. Um, 
they have, because they come in blocks, obviously, uh, you can see the block numbers there. Um, each transaction has a hash, so that once you submit a transaction, you already have the hash, so that you can then go and look up your you can check the status of your transaction. Some of them failed, some of them succeeded. Um, right. So now, pardon me. Now we have a system where we have code sitting on a blockchain where every transaction is visible, immutable. I can't change my own transactions because uh, the whole thing about this consensus thing is it's is designed in such a way that it will be prohibitively expensive for anyone to try and change history that's more than a few seconds old. Right. Um, okay, so now the main thing is, I said everyone agrees with it, which means if I'm running a node on my computer and you're running a node on your computer, my computer and your computer have got exactly the same system space. Right? I mean, it might be it might be stored differently depending upon which nodes we're using, but the information is the same. Right? It's much like. You know, you could be using Postgres, I could be using MySQL, right? Same data, different format, but the data is always the same, yeah? Okay, so once that happens, there's no central point of failure anymore. Right? So, you could take out Amazon and you'll still have systems running which, which contain the Ethereum blockchain. And then somebody starts up a new node and they'll start syncing from, from the nodes which are still up. Okay, so now the big question is what, uh, if you're going to do that, the camera's, I keep looking away from the camera, hi camera, um, okay, uh, so what, what, would, what would you want to do with a blockchain? There are things which are sensible for doing on blockchains and there are a lot of things which are not sensible. The obvious kind of things which are worth doing on the blockchain are things where you have multiple parties involved. If one person, if, if, the only, if it's just one person doing it and nobody else gives a damn about what they're doing, they may as well use a database. Right? Um, so you need to have multiple parties involved. You need to have a degree of conflicting interest and a degree of common interest. Right? So, um, this normally applies to the kind of systems that most people build. I mean, having customers and people offering services and so on is a good start to that. Right? Having businesses which supply things to each other, you know, their common interest is making sure the system runs, making sure that it can continue doing business, but their conflicting interest is that, you know, I, I need to make sure that you don't con me, and you need to make sure I don't con you. I don't overcharge, undercharge, whatever. Right? Okay. Uh, that's probably... About, okay, we can go a little bit further. Um, so, we've got this byte code, which you saw, which looks horrific. The assembly language looks equally horrific. Uh, there are a number of languages used for programming the block for writing these contracts. The most common is Solidity, which was inspired by JavaScript. There are two which were inspired by Python, Serpent, which has kind of died, and Viper, which hasn't yet arrived. Um, <laughs> there is like, you could, you could write in the assembler, you could write in something called LLL, um, as a little hint, nobody does except a few techies at the Ethereum Foundation. Right, so really the most common thing is Solidity, which is a JavaScript-like language, and it's got all these things that we expect you to have, like constructors, functions, uh, functions that return data, functions which don't return data, um, persistent <coughs> information, right, so that you send two transactions, the second one knows what can find it, can see the result of the first transaction. 
Ah, uh, one contract can talk to another. And that is probably where I'm going to stop here. Right, um, I think that is a very good place to stop. Yes? Another question. Good, uh, great. Now we get interactive. I like this. Um, so, uh, what is the reason that like we, uh, we had to go and make this uh, Solidity language? Like, uh, what is it that JavaScript by itself uh, uh, couldn't do uh, to write these smart contracts? Uh huh. Uh, okay, so we're going to come back to here again, aren't we? Okay, so what have we got here? Um, I'll, I'll run through these then. In that case, okay, we create contracts. Contracts are like classes, not entirely unlike JavaScript, right? Um, gas. You have to pay for every single transaction you execute, and the amount you pay depends upon the amount of the amount of instructions you execute to perform that instruction, and the amount of new storage you create. So if you do either, so you can get an estimation, but you can never know exactly how much something is going to cost, unless of course you can see the contract and you know it's going to be consistent. Right? Um, it's types. No. Okay. One well, first, the first really important thing about this is the way. It, you can do two things to a contract. You can ask for ask for information, or you can change the state of the contract. You can't do both at once, right? Okay. So if you want to change the state of the contract, you fire off a transaction, and you wait. You wait until some guy out there is kind enough to take your your transaction and put it into a block and put the block on the end of the chain and for everyone else to agree that your transaction really deserves its place in that block and that block deserves its place in the chain. That could take some time. Uh, I have waited for half a day, almost a day, for some transactions to be mined right at peak periods. Um, it shouldn't happen, but it does. right? However, if you want to query the state of a contract, how many different nodes do you need to talk to? Well, we already said that my node is exactly the same as your node, is the same as his node, is the same as his node, is the same as the lady over there's node, and so on. So I should talk to any of them. So I just talk to my own node. Nothing is transmitted across the network, no consensus required, no mining right. into blocks required. It's free of charge because it happens on my notebook now. Oh, uh, but right. you mean your own copy of the ledger, right? Yeah, yeah okay. that's right. So it's cheap, yeah. right? Nothing gets changed. I don't change any memory. Except the storage. Huh? Storage. I don't change the storage. I'm just, no, I'm just asking. The, how big is the blockchain right now? Oh, well, it's quite big, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a few tens, it's a few, it's a few gigabytes. Okay. Quite <laughs> a few gigabytes. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so the point, the point is it doesn't cost anything in terms of my transaction. To make that query, so I mean, this is something very serious. So that you pay for it in what's called gas, and it's calculated by the amount of gas you use, which is which is the number of instructions, the type of instructions, the amount of storage, plus the gas price, which is how much you elect to to offer to pay for that. And the people who put them into blocks will choose the most profitable ones first. Okay. Um, right. So there's that. So. If you make a transaction that changes the blockchain, the only way that you'll get the only two ways you can get information back is by once it's been mined, you can look at the new state of the contract, but somebody else could get in another transaction, and that will confuse you. Or you, or it can put information into a log, right? Using using events, right? So I mean, this is totally on JavaScript, right? Um. I'm guessing that modifiers you usually modifiers. use in Solidity, that's something that JavaScript doesn't have. So yeah, in JavaScript, it would be impossible to mark a function as read only or mark a function as internal only, stuff like that. Yeah. So but more, like to, theory you could but more to the point, all transactions right. come from a particular person. All right? yeah. Calls, you can call something without caring who sends it, but for sending information, it comes from a particular person. Right, you saw it. from Dave to the contract, right? A modifier 
can check to see am I approved to execute that function All right this is one of the key this is so you uh, a modifier is a bit like a macro where you where you, um, where you can just put this at the head of the function you can say only the owner can execute this or only an admin can execute this right um, you'd never do the Tower of Hanoi in a smart contract because you've got a very limited stack depth okay right uh, there's no concurrency you cannot possibly have concurrency transactions are executed one at a time and of course one thing about that is if you if you send a transaction and I send a transaction we have no idea whose transaction is going to be executed first but once my transaction starts executing it will finish executing before yours gets in or vice versa um we have this thing called ether so built into the system we have a, pay, uh, a unit of payment called ether so um, a function can specifically be enabled to take pay, to accept payment if you don't if you don't specify it as payable it will not be able to take payment your contract can also send ether Right. Okay. So I mean, you know, so like during you know, you've heard about ICOs, ways of raising funds. People send ether to your contract. Your contract will then send the ether on to a multi-signature wallet, right? Um, I'll go through the lot. We've got we're doing quite well so far. Um, the way of calling them are very interesting. That you actually, when you call a contract, it is the data which specify which function you're going to call and the parameters that go to it if you try to call a function that doesn't exist the function can still the, the contract can still have a catch all function called a fallback function right and so um, yeah uh, that's quite that is used I mean like normally you won't you won't use a catch uh, use a fallback for that it will confuse the heck out of you if, if you know if you, so like if you've got a fallback function you've got another internal function somebody could actually try and send an instruction to the internal function but it will be so it will go to the callback function because it's not allowed to execute the internal function that really threw me for a while contracts can be taken out of the blockchain well, they can't be taken out of the blockchain. This is rubbish. Yeah, like, uh, but what, what you can do is you can disable a contract from the time the instruction self-destruct is executed. Uh, right? So once that, if someone self-destructs contract, any, transa any, any transactions that go to it in future will fail yeah, so. because, it can, because there's nothing. It'll, it'll, it's like going into a void. Right? You can still see what you can still see what it was the state of the contract just before you destroyed it because you can always all the transactions are there on the blockchain you can still rebuild up to any point so as long as I've got the source co source code of your contract I can emulate your contract and just apply transaction 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 and know what your contract was like at any point right? um, Coinbase boring Ah, uh, multiple return values. We got multiple return values in Go, haven't we? Yeah, we do. I, I keep on having to check now because I'm doing so, so many languages, and apparently they have them in JavaScript as well. Um, time is block time. Yeah, uh, how does time work? How does if, what if I time if I run an Ethereum node and I change the time to one hour later? Doesn't matter. So, you're, you're talking about block time, or block time of, of the miner. Uh, the whole network has to. If a miner proposes a block and the time is out by more than a few milliseconds, the other all the nodes in the network will, re will reject it. Right? So I mean, time is also done by consensus. But so, but there is. So you, your contract you can, get, can never depend on exact time. It can only depend on time yeah. within a few seconds. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, which means that if you if you're talking about like calculating like. 
For example, in Hello Gold, we do we do daily gold storage fees. And I calculate it based upon midnight in Malaysia. Right now, it could be like half a second either way or whatever. That doesn't matter too much. But you should never do something like trying to use it to see the random number generator because the miners who mine your block could manipulate the timestamp within a little window, right? So you can use time for time, but don't use it for anything else. Um, then, next question. Can, oh. you, can you even get a random number? <laughs> Is that something that's supported no, by not. Ethereum? I don't think so. Does it doesn't even make sense in that case that if you can actually store code, can you actually, you can you actually store some other value other than just ether in yeah. your contract? Yeah. Exactly. So if you already have, for instance, in your previous contract, your previous yeah. game, a number yeah. to get a running number, you just add one. Yeah. Do what you like. Yeah. You got a programming unless, language. Unless you can do what the hell you like. The like right. number generator is just adding one all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you just pay an ether. Can, can you buy it all return yeah. one? Yeah, same of course one? you can. You can do what you like. Right, you can you, you can you can have each person having their own their own running numbers. Um, the final thing is that, which is probably one of the most important things, is that um, you know, I said that you can you can have a function that, for example, only one person can execute. So a transaction from only one address will execute it. If it doesn't, you will revert the you will revert the transaction. And at any point from the beginning to the end of a transaction, if you revert the transaction, then all changes or no changes are permitted. It's as if that transaction didn't happen. Except for the fact the person sending it loses a bit of gas. Right? So there we go. That is that. Um, so that's like what we have a language, it's got a few quirks most of which are really to do with blockchain. Um, if some, so like your contract can find out how much ether you sent, it can find out who sent it, it can find out when that instruction was, or not when it was sent, but when it was mined. Um, and apart from that, you've got a general purpose programming language, so what can you do with it? And now it becomes a question of what do you want to do with it? Um, it's quite heavily, um, you know, it's a very full, full, you know, pretty full featured language. You've got, um, oddly, you have no signed numbers, everything is unsigned, but it goes up to 256 bit signed numbers, which is pretty cool. Right? It has no floating point numbers yet, or it has no, such I say, decimal point type numbers. But, the way, but then people generally, unless you have a good reason for doing it, your unsigned number is either with zero decimal points or with 18 decimal places, right? So uh, when you're talking about ether, ether is divided up into subunits. So one ether is one followed by 18 zeros in decimal, right? Why such high integers? Two hundred. Well, I guess you say two hundred fifty-six bits. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very few. Two hundred fifty-six ought to be enough for everyone. I say it probably seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, it is still possible to overflow it. What? But since you're storing numbers in the blockchain, like every time you store something in your contract, it yeah. ends up on everyone's PC. Yeah. Doesn't it just generate like a lot of zero well, no, I mean, you can, everywhere? Is you, can, you can also have smaller values if you want. Okay. Impact them okay. if you design it right. Actually, related really question. I think I know the answer, but I just want to ask. You. If a lot of these should cause gas to actually run, and people are just writing in um, solidity JavaScript. Yeah. How do people actually debug or ensure that it's working as expected and not oops? <laughs> ah, there are debuggers. Unfortunately, the best one um, sort of died, um, which is a great shame because it was absolutely fantastic. Um, it, they, it was it was working up until April and then they gave up on the project. Um, but 
Um, yeah, I'm in this point. Well, if it malfunctions, if it still works but malfunctions, you can always ha have it logging what it's doing and that will give you information. You can trace through the instructions, but the, in my view, the tools that trace your contract are not fantastic yet. Does it, make, uh, th does it mean that to be able to develop a smart contract normally is just that you'll be writing it um, and running it on your own test blockchain and test data first. Mm -hmm. Once you are certain whatever code you've written is actually correct, then you'll just be able to use that as a smart contract running on the actual blockchain against uh, real you know, things. With, with, one small, with one small step missed out. The small step, the small step that's missed out is once you stick it on the blockchain and people start using it, it's sort of like fixed. So normally, you will debug, you will debug either, either in a test environment or on a test chain, and then when you're pretty sure, pretty certain that it's absolutely one hundred percent okay, you will then send it to an auditor who will probably run automated tests on it. They will then also have people with a hell of a lot of experience looking through it for common pitfalls to make sure that you haven't made any mistakes. It's based on JavaScript, right? Yeah, kinda. <laughs> kinda. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So it's um, the usual JavaScript contracts? Mm, no, not 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 the same because it is a typed language. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, I mean, the compiler will catch quite a lot. There are automated testers which test for a lot of the common problems. But I mean, you can come. But I mean, there have been a lot of things that people have found out through trial and error because it's still pretty much in the beta phase, right? Um, and. I, th I, I think I can quite safely say that I've probably only just started getting contracts back from auditors where they don't actually find everything. Oh, they find things and they, and they object about my coding style, but I don't care if I'm a dinosaur, right? But I mean, you know, where at least they're saying, okay, there are no, there are no actual coding mistakes. Um, because there are just so many different things you've got you to take into consideration. So the auditors are humans? Uh, machines and machines and humans. So chain security, for example, come out of the, uh, the security lab at ETH Zurich. They have got a big testing tool for, for testing that you don't make any of a whole load of ranges mistakes. And then they also look at it. So Dave, we're at a Golang meetup and I saw before on your GitHub page that you also write Go code. What does Go code have to do with this? Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> damn! I think course again. Uh, apart from the fact, okay, we'll start with the, with the first really obvious thing. The best implementation of this, uh, not in terms of speed. The fastest, the fastest node is written in Rust. Uh, which also has some nice features, but the probably the most fully function and the reference implementation for this is written in Go. And if you ever one, if you if you always work on small projects, you may not understand really the value of Go. If you've ever had a look at Bitcoin, Monero. Stellar, Ripple, the co or even the C++ implementation of Ethereum, it gets scary. People use undocumented libraries that are on GitHub, but you look at it, and those libraries use other undocumented, and you, you, you just get lost. The reference implementation, Go Ethereum, I don't know, to, uh, to me it's like poetry, it really is. It's readable. You may, you, know, you may have to dig for a while, you may have to try and figure out what it's doing, you know, particularly like if you're not so experienced in coding. But it is readable. You can see where everything comes from because you've got the import list at the top, for example. Um, 
and most of the import list comes from inside inside the code base and you can find it and you know which folder each file is coming from right the dependency isn't all sorted out by some obscure make file somewhere so that's the first thing um, because that implementation is written in go there are quite a few tools and helpers written in go and you can link into the code base to do a lot of stuff does that work? Do you actually use the Go version? Oh, I, I do. I do. Of course I do. Okay. Right? So uh, at this point, am I supposed to talk about some of the stuff I've done? Maybe you can show some Maybe I can show some stuff. Oh, God. Right. Um, okay, let's see what we can do. Um, I'll take you through. I'll, I'll, let's start with talking about a few of the things that I have done. And then we'll see which of these paths we want to go down. Some are nastier than others. Um, okay, if we look through if we look through this list, um, one of the ones is events and logs. And let's kill this now. Let's see if we can find an ether scan. This is an ether scan. Okay, a little plug for ether scan. Um, search by address. Okay. Which is developed by Malaysian, right? It damn well is. Yes. One of, the, one of the nicest things about Etherscan is it is developed in KL by, Ma by Matthew Tan and Lee Chuan and a, a few others. Uh, in a writ and Etherscan is the Google of the Ethereum network. So it's absolutely amazing. We have something nice and local. Um, okay, so I'm going to look at this one. This is, this is something that goes to a contract. I have no idea what it did. I'll find out in a minute. Oops, no, no, that really doesn't help, does it? Transfer how much? Ooh, it transferred ether. There was no data. Okay, fine. Yeah, that works. Okay, so this um, is sending ether to a crowd sale contract or something. Um, this. Like that. Yeah, let's make it a bit bigger. Right, here we go. So you've got the transaction hash, you've got the status, success. This is the block it was at. Uh, it's got a timestamp. This, it, from this particular account, it went to that contract. It transferred some ether. Um, I provided it with this much gas and it used that much. It cost me $2.62 to do it. Each instruction has a knot, so that um, if I send the same instruction twice, it will have a different hash for each instruction. Right? Um, right. Also, that happened is that when this went into the contract, it created some event logs. Right? And as you can see, these are so obvious, I don't have to explain them, right? Oh, come on, stop nodding. <coughs> stop saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is, this is, this is obscure shit, right? Um, what you have got is the address of the contract. I have two different contracts there, both of which created events. Um, the first topic is the hash of the function I was executing and then the rest of it are the parameters that I sent to it. So as you can see it is quite unreadable. Now Etherscan themselves interpret certain kinds of these transactions, these logs, but they only, trans they only do like token movement. Right? Uh, and they only do token movement for the most common standard, the ERC-20 standard. Unfortunately, some people went and created other standards. Uh, and somebody asked me to create a token tracker for other standards. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I have two questions, but uh, second question depends on the first question. Okay, <laughs> so you've got one and a half questions. So, yeah? uh, if I want to create a system which I own privately, and Centralized. So should I go for blockchain or not? No. No. Okay. So uh, the question, if nobody else is interested in it, okay, then so why the should you? The question is why is many private companies like even banks and so on 
uh, invest so much in blockchain if they um, don't own it? Because they're look because they're looking more for like interbank settlement systems and things like that. They're looking for systems where that are multi-party systems. No bank can survive on its own. It has to talk to other banks. You can even uh, you can even have even inside an organization you can have competing parties. So they're going to create some system that even they themselves can own. Yeah, I mean you. Can, you have the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which is um, a multi-party system trying to create a version, of an Ethereum platform for multi-party transactions, right? And coming up with versions which have got like privacy built in and things like that, right? And a lot of money is being invested on this, so that people, you, know, you can have different parties all cooperating and yet competing. Right? I mean, even even in the bank, the audit department uh, disagree with everybody else, right? So you've got conflicting interests, right? But if it's just for you, then no. But if it's for you and your business partner, <coughs> and you each have, um, well, hopefully, you know, like three partners, <coughs> then you know. <coughs> So, one thing that I have done in Go is to write something which looks at the ERC-223 standard, yeah. which is not a standard, but unfortunately some people have got tokens based on it, and those people who have based tokens on it are now stuck with the fact that Etherscan doesn't want to talk to it, and so somebody said, hey, can you build me a token tracker? And if I can find it, we can have a look at the source code, and everybody can go, hooray, right? Let's have a go. Um, the difference between ERC-223 and zero? ERC-20. Okay, I will show you that before we go. Right. Um, oh, self-key token track. We don't want the self-key token track. We want this. Ding. Boom. Okay. Some time ago, I told you that the hash function for use inside Ethereum is ketchup256. And the way you, def you derive the signature for a function to send something to it is using the catch-up. And the way an event is tracked is also using the catch-up of the event signature. In ERC-20, you have transfer, address, address, uint256, close brackets, and okay sorry okay this is the event the event begins with a capital t and in the log and a transfer event would have that entire string right that entire string at the bottom d d f whatever and if we go into for example here self key token tracker that probably works if I can find, okay, here is a transfer. If I look at that transaction there, and I look at the event log, you will find here 0xddf252. In here, it says 0xddf252. That is the signature of a transfer event. So what it means is that if you actually succeed in doing a transfer, an ERC20 token, We'll put out that signature. And that is what Etherscan is looking for. Right? Um, coincidentally, uh, or other, in addition, extra, extra unwanted information, the function you call is the same function, but it's got a lowercase t, and it only has one address because it goes a transfer from me to you. And this A0959. 059CBV, that, that is part of the instruction you send to make a transfer happen. However, going back, one of the things about the... So Etherscan looks for this hash, and it says a token has been transferred. Uh, the ERC223, unfortunately has got that. 
And it doesn't matter where, whether you've got any data or not, it's got that. Which means the hash is different, which means that Etherscan do not pay any attention to it. If you've got an ERC-223 token, Etherscan will not even recognize that it's a token. Okay? Right, so having got... Yes? To, do, to analyze the blockchain. No, easy. Easy. Seriously easy. Um, and I'll take you through that as well in a bit, okay? So all closely, like, uh, if I want to be able to access the blockchain and the Ethereum, how would actually one actually go about inspecting the state of I know that technically it's that all data is actually in the blockchain. Yes, with yeah. all the contracts. Yeah. Okay. So what tool would anyone be able to just scan the blockchain? Well, for, scan for scanning, you probably use Etherscan and their APIs. Okay. Unless so you're having a bad day and Etherscan's down. That means that Etherscan is actually a hosted service for yes. some, something else. But you can do exactly the same. Yes. And I can show you how to do so it. So Etherscan, is it just a program or a web service that's actually running? Well, it's a web service that's running a whole load of programs in the back end, and they actually scan the entire all the transactions and they analyze them to death and they store things in a database so they don't have to keep going back to the blockchain. How do you trust any data that's actually coming from the scan if you're not running locally? Because it's that you'll be trusting a centralized third party instead of... Because you can verify it yourself if you have to. Does anyone does it? Yeah, I do. Okay. Just in case. You know why I do? Because you don't trust Etherscan. No, because, Ether, because at the time I needed it most, Etherscan went down. It's a damn good thing I knew how to do it. Because otherwise I would be dead now because my, my CEO would have killed me. So basically <laughs> it's that if you want to run through yeah. all the data about yeah. the blockchain that yeah. you already have synced up because you are yeah. running it, yeah. how would you go about it? Is there any tools in terms of the gap or anything to be able to oh, yeah. just go through? Well, I mean, okay, yeah, I mean you, can, you can make JSON calls to start with. No, I mean, not just, uh, okay, if that's just, for instance, uh, you cannot, but you can, it just huh? scan it down. Yeah. Is that uh, what tools are available that in whatever preferred language you go or otherwise you will be able to go yeah. through to actually inspect anything that's actually inside? Yeah. The yeah. For instance, like uh, what are uh, what are the transactions done by I don't know some other guys? Okay. So what you're actually saying is that if you wanted, if you had like a token, and you want to see all the token transactions, um, could you? Exit. That's not a good thing to say, is it, Paratina? Hang on. Let's just see what who this thing to what this thing talks to. Ah, oh, see, I got Go code. Hey guys, I got Go code. Whoa! What the hell am I talking to? That's the question. Please tell me I'm not talking to Parity. F client. No, I can't be. Um, I'm, 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 have I got config.json here? Let me see. What did I do? It doesn't work. Oh yeah, it does. Okay, I'm talking to Infura. Okay, um, you can talk to a local node using JSON, using JSON or IPC. There are also people who host nodes that you can connect to, which is what we're going to be doing now because that's what we're going to do now. Okay, so if I run it first, go, run. What's it called? G. I don't know what this, I have no idea what this is going to do. It's connected to this thing called Infura, and this is showing me all of the transactions for a not very popular token. Yeah, but you're running it offline, isn't it? I mean, you're no. actually. I'm connecting to someone else's node now, uh, yeah, right? Okay. But, but I could equally connect it to my own node, right? All I would have to do would be to change this one line here, which you can't possibly see because it's way too small. No, it's too big. That's fine. Yeah, but you can't see the line. The line, the line appears up there, right? So here I'm saying get client mainnet infura IO followed by my own key. Right? I'm telling it to look at that contract here. Right? If I don't go to Infura, I could also go to localhost colon 8545, which is the, the port for talking to any Ethereum node. And normally that's what I will do. Um, particularly if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm posting transactions, I always work with a local node. 
because if I run a parity node, it's got a multitasking backend, I can put in 4,000 transactions before it overflows. I can have 4,000 pending transactions, right? Which I will also, I mean, I'm not going to do it because it costs money, but I can show you some of that. Okay, so what I do is I get a client. I then, this topic here, let's have a look at that topic. What's that topic? 0x E19260. E19260. E19260, right? That's the transfer, an ERC223 transfer. That is my topic. I create a filter query where I put that topic in there. Right? So now I'm saying return me the logs from the blockchain which use this GXE VC address here. Now this thing common dot hex to address is just pulled out of the geth out of the geth source code. I'm linking into geth to run this. Right? The the so this our question. This client is, is part of Geth. Is this uh, basically uh, using the Geth library, which yes. is the Ethereum client implemented oh, yeah. in Go? Yeah. So that means is that you're deep uh, linking into Ethereum it. Ethereum is actually implemented. One of the nodes is actually implemented in Go. Yeah. But there's enough libraries to for you to be able to write a standalone Go program yeah. based to scan through the blockchain to do whatever you need, yeah. including if you have any business analysis or any yeah. other things you need. Yeah. So, and you can send trans I mean I've got little libraries to do send transactions and things like that. Okay. And I'll tell you about those as well in a bit if you like. So how many lines of code are we looking at here to be able to scan through and for uh, my lines of code? Um well let me see. I got I got blank lines in here. One hundred? No, less than that. I mean, it, does, it doesn't go up. It only goes to seventy nine, and and there's a, there's blank space in there. Right. I mean, the only thing I, I've got I've got that data structure, which I think I don't even use. I don't use that. Okay. Right. Um, so I'll take you through it. So, okay, I, I can ask it to do one particular look for one particular person's address, which I'm not doing. So that's something else you could take out of there. Um, so I'm looking. Uh, transactions purely on that address. I'm I'm building a client. Um, I print that another wasted line. I build a, I build a filter. So now it's going when it brings back returns, it uses that filter to filter out everything. It uses what are called Bloom filters, right? Um, I since I'm looking at transactions on one particular token. I only start looking at the blockchain from the time that token was launched. So I've reduced it. How much slower would it be if you set that scroll block to zero or one? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, but the client is actually a host of Ethereum, so it's fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Whoops, do you want to see it again? Yeah, I, I, I mean, so basically, you've got all these Merkle trees doing crazy shit, which yeah. I don't understand because I can't be bothered to read it. Which allow you to 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 slice and dice the storage in various ways. It uses Bloom filters so that at the beginning of a whole block, you know whether there's anything which which is going to match your filter. At least you don't know, but you can be quite sh pretty certain. It only gives false positives, not false negatives. Right. So I created the filter. I then, I just ask it to filter the logs. That's the call to the Ethereum thing. And now I just get back a load of log entries, right? I, so now all these log entries, I check to, I check to, to make sure that it is a transfer. And if it's not, I just go to the next one. Uh, and much of this now is just extracting information. Because I'm going to get, I get like this long, long string of data which I have to extract the from address, the to address, and so on. And then I print it out. Block, I, I give you the block number, the fact it transferred from, to, and a certain amount. So at Hello Vault, do you actually use code like this to keep yes. track of what you can do with your token? Okay. So do you want the embarrassing story? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, okay, firstly, do you remember 
about six months ago, there was this post on Reddit from this guy who started the job on his first day. He, he was immediately put to work on a production database. And, and the best comment he got from anybody was, I'm the guy who nuked the database at GitLab. Do you remember that? Okay, right. So we have a contract. We, we have two tokens, right? One of them was the one we sold during the ICO which we used to raise funds to support the growth of the company. And we, were, we have, the, the other one is a gold-backed token. What? Uh, just FYI, you are still Hi. Alive. Yeah, so it's recorded. So it's, oh. And just in case. Just in case. <laughs> no, good point, that. Good point. I will take that. I will take this one offline, I think. Um, okay, so basically things happened, right? Let's just say things happened that we needed, we, we were already planning to launch a new, a new gold backed contract, but we needed to make certain adjustments, right? Details later. <laughs> we, need, we needed to make, okay, so we, um, oh good, that means it'll run out. And I can, okay, so we needed to make cer certain adjustments to the values in the contract in doing the migration. And Etherscan was down. Etherscan was not working. They were having some big migration problem. And we had to make sure that everything we transferred from the old contract to the new contract was absolutely 100% accurate because we don't, want to, we don't want to deprive people of, of the gold tokens they've got or anything like that. So we, we used code very much like this to do, to do a simulation of the entire system, right? And we made sure that everybody received exactly the right amount. And there were some very complex adjustments in there. And we had to get it all done by midnight because after midnight, we imposed another day's fees and we'd have to go back and do all the calculations again. So yeah, we made a slight cock up, but we were, but we were due to launch the new contract anyway. So it all came out right in the end, thank God. <laughs> yeah, so to speak. Yes, okay, so you didn't hear that. Uh, okay, so yes, there we go. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, uh, anyone have any questions? Any questions? Oh, what, am I running out of time already? Yeah. yeah. Good heavens, okay, that's cool. Um, okay, I've got logs here. Um, I, okay, another one that I have got is... I have got a script that can fire off transactions, right? We use it internally um, to transfer, e if we need to transfer ether to a large number of people or transfer tokens to a large number of people. So it's just code that, do that does that. Um, and one company were running their ICO just over a week ago and they, something had happened and they needed to launch a new contract which meant they had got 4,000 pre-allocations to put into the new contract which they'd already put into the old contract but they had to put it into the new one and they had like 20,000 um, authorizations you know, um, what do you call it, whitelists to do and so I, 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 I did the pre-allocations for them and I gave them the program so they could do the whitelisting and they all had it done on time and they're eternally grateful. <laughs> so, yeah, you can do amazing stuff with it, right? So, like that second one, you're actually making transactions. So, you, so, so I, create, I create a key pair, I put Ether into the key pair so it can pay for the transactions. Um, another thing that I do is I have got... Um, the Go Ethereum code base has got a simulated backend, which is a one-state blockchain. You can't go back in time, but you can roll it forward, you can push transactions into it, commit them, and then see the next state. And I built an entire system around that where I launch a contract. Say I can launch a crowd sale contract. I can create 10,000 addresses, each of them with Ether, and they, they all like push transactions into this contract, and I keep moving it forward in time. And at the end of it, I can analyze the results. 
And I built a scripting engine around that, which is really cool. It uses reflection. So I don't actually have to declare things in two different places. Um, so yeah, I built a scripting engine for it. So I, so you can you can actually just write test scripts to test the to test the contract. There we go. Does that work? Yeah.